On the 10th of March, 1876, the world changed forever. I'm sure some of you might know what happened on the 10th of March, 1876, but then on the flip side, some of you might be like me and be quite terrible with dates. Because on this day, it was on this day that the first ever words were uttered through a telephone. And upon his creation, Alexander Graham Bell opened up a new age of technology which revolutionized the world which we live in. With just nine simple words, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. The world changed and the rest, as they say, was history. And how much technology has developed as we're sitting here now, reaping the benefits of hundreds of years of work sharing video wirelessly. And whilst that's a lovely story to introduce a Zoom talk, the reason I've begun tonight with Mr. Bow this evening is because tonight we're actually going to prove him wrong. Not because of his work with the telephone, but actually because of something he said, which is still quoted to this very day, every single day. It's a, it's a quote I'm sure we, well, I'm certain we all know. He once said, when one door closes, another door opens. And I'm sure we can all relate to these words. But when we consider this expression in the context of our subject tonight, we're going to see that actually with regards to salvation, Jesus Christ is the only door and there's no other door beside him. Okay, let's try and keep up with the slides tonight, Sim. So we're continuing, I understand, um, a series looking at the different I am statements of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, you might find, certainly we found this at Coventry West when we we're going through a similar series, that, that there was a lot of um, overlap in, in these subjects. But at the same time, with each figure of speech, we're provided with a new aspect to the nature of Jesus. And with each study, we find that there's something new to learn, particularly with regards to the salvation which Christ provides. So this week, of course, we're looking at uh, the expression, I am the door of the sheep, which we read in John chapter 10. And so tonight it's our job to try and understand what Jesus is teaching when he says this. And we're going to see that actually it's not a complex lesson at all. And so I'm not going to overcomplicate this subject. I'm going to try and keep it quite simple. And so tonight, um, I'm hoping we can all keep up. I, I imagine we will be able to. And perhaps at times you'll certainly be ahead of me. But either way, hopefully we can enjoy our time together around God's word. So where it says here uh, in John chapter 10, we're looking at verse 7. He first introduces himself as I am the door of the sheep. And we see that this is part of a wider speech. And we, and we read the whole context for a reason. Hopefully you could appreciate that. Um, it, what we didn't continue to read was that the speech then goes on to say that Jesus also describes himself as the good shepherd. Now, that's someone else's subject. So I'm going to be careful not to talk about that too much. But there is obviously going to be a little bit of overlap. But we're going to see that the message behind it, even though the pattern and the imagery is quite similar, the message itself is quite different. So we are going to be able to treat that subject differently to our own and stay within the parameters of our own subject tonight. So to help us understand this idea of what Jesus meant when he said, I am the door, um, we need to, first of all, realise and understand the context. So the context and, and particularly who Jesus was speaking to. And we saw that at the end of chapter nine, it just continues to flow through into chapter 10. Uh, so the last verse says, Jesus says to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt, but now that ye see, say now that you say we see, your guilt remains. So the them in that verse that Jesus is speaking to is the Pharisees that we see in verse 40. They drew near to him and heard these things and said to him, and I'm reading from the ESV tonight in case some of those verses didn't match up perfectly. And the, the section that we read from about the Pharisees there was talking about how the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews at that time, the spiritual leaders, had kicked out 
the blind man or the man that was blind from the temple because he proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ. And they had an issue with this because they said that he was a disciple of Christ. And they said, in contrast, they were disciples of Moses. So they kicked him out. And we have this, this dialogue then that follows where Christ describes these Pharisees, these leaders as blind people. And that's a theme which we're going to see falls in nicely with this idea of Christ being a door. So already there's a lot of images going on and we're not, we're not too much closer to working out what Christ is getting at when he says, I am the door. But we know it's something to do with these bad leaders, these bad spiritual leaders, and that they couldn't quite work out that Jesus was there. Well, Jesus doesn't just say, I am the door. He says, I am the door of the sheep. Now, obviously, we know that Jesus later says, I am the good shepherd. Um, And I did say we weren't going to go into what that might be, but we kind of need to understand what sheep represent in the Bible before we can go any further. When Jesus says, I'm the door of the sheep, is he talking about literal sheep here? Well, I'm going to present to you that he certainly isn't talking about literal sheep here. He's talking about his disciples, his followers. Um, We had in our first hymn, I think it was taken from Psalm 5, this idea of being led as sheep by Christ. And it's it's not unique to Psalm 5. We have it in the Psalm, Psalm 23, um, where God is described as a shepherd for his flock. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, Ezekiel 34, we have a lot of condemnation on the spiritual leaders at the time who were like bad shepherds. And they they weren't leading the people in the way they should be led. And consequently, God was going to intervene and judge the spiritual leaders. And he was going to become the shepherd for his own people. And that sort of comes out to us as it's almost as though it's a prophecy. Well, it is, it is a prophecy, but it's almost as though that prophecy is fulfilled um, when Christ speaks about the bad shepherds uh, in Matthew chapter 9. So I'm going to go to Matthew 9 because uh, it's not too far away. We will pick up some of the verses uh, that I allude to on the screen, but we won't go to everyone tonight. And in Matthew chapter 9, we're looking at the section uh, verse 36. So uh, we see here, verse 35, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Quoting from Ezekiel 34. And he's saying the people of this time, this day, were like the people that were in the land back in the time of Ezekiel without spiritual leaders. And so Jesus then is presenting himself as a shepherd because the shepherds of the day were failing. And we see that in Matthew 15, he alludes to exactly the same thing. But he says here, he expounds on that a little bit more. He says that his primary focus, although it's to save the Jews, Salvation will be handed out to the Gentiles, too. So it's not just limited to Israel. So this figure of speech um, that we have in John 10, Christ being a door to the sheep, we have the sheep presented as followers of Christ, not just Jews, but also Gentiles, too, those who follow him. So if that's sheep, how about the sheepfold that we're introduced to then? So chapter 10, verse 1, he talks about the sheepfold. And then after that, immediately after that, he then talks about himself being the door. Well, the door that we have is the door to the sheepfold. Now, sheepfolds is is perhaps not something we're familiar with today. Sheepfolds back in Bible times and around that time before and after, we used to keep sheep um, safe during the night, either in the field or up on the mountains, sheepfolds were simply places of refuge for sheep. And these used to come in all sorts of different forms, but essentially they were just simple walled areas with a hole in the front as a door. Some of them were perhaps more like barns with a roof over the top, but most of them were just uh, four walls with a gap in the side for the door, really simple structures. Now, some of these sheepfolds would have been personal sheepfolds. Some of them would have been communal ones where lots of shepherds would come to and keep their flock. 
But all we need to know really for this is that the sheepfold was a place of refuge from wild animal, animals and robbers and, at night. And the important thing about a sheepfold is, of course, that it only has one door. Now, it only has one door because that way it meant the sheep couldn't escape out the back door. Um, and likewise, enemies or, or thieves or animals couldn't come in through any other door apart from the main front door, which would have been on watch. So what's the symbol here? Well, First Peter chapter 2, verse 25. We're going we're gonna to jump in right at the end of an argument, which we probably shouldn't really do because we don't pick up all the context. Uh, but we'll be able to get the gist of it. So in, in 1 Peter 2, Jesus is talking, sorry, Peter here is talking about um, people who are sinning, people who, are, who have lost their way. And then verse 25, right at the end of the chapter, he says, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. People who have gone away from Christ are like straying sheep. And it's almost as though the image is that if we if we are found um, that we are straying from Christ and from his uh, ecclesia, then it's almost as though we're going out the sheepfold. It's like the sheepfold is a representation of the ecclesia. And if we were to follow Christ as closely as possible, we would make sure that we are in that ecclesia and in that sheepfold. So what are we to learn about this door then, this door to this sheepfold. Well, traditionally, it's understood that the shepherd would often sleep across the door to keep the sheep inside safe. It would stop any uh, enemies being able to come through, any wild animals. It would also stop the sheep from just wandering through. And that suddenly creates a beautiful type of Christ because Christ literally laid down his life to ensure our salvation. And we have a picture here, a beautiful picture of him as an overseer for his ecclesia, having laid down his life that we might be saved. But there's also an important lesson here with regards to our salvation. Uh, because in John 10, it says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. There's only one honest and genuine way into a sheepfold. If you don't go through Christ, then you can't be in the sheepfold. And that's contrasted then, isn't it, to the previous chapter where we have uh, verse 28, 29. These Pharisees hanging on, clinging on to being disciples of Moses. But actually, there was no salvation for them because they had failed themselves in keeping the law. The only way to truly enter the sheepfold was through Christ. And we do that, don't we, through baptism. And that's fundamental to our beliefs as Christadelphians. Clause 15 of the Statement of Faith says that he sent forth apostles to proclaim salvation through him as the only name under heaven, whereby men may be saved. And that's what Peter says to the Jews in Acts 4. He says, in Jesus alone, we have salvation. There's no other name. There's no other way into the ecclesia. Uh, and we could look at verses about the importance of baptism, um, that we might be associated with his saving name. But it, it's an important verse we can have to have a discussion with people who believe that God will save them just by being good people. Uh, just by being a good person doesn't get, through, get you through the door. You get through the door by taking on the name of Christ, don't we? And so we've seen then that Christ is the only door. He is our access to salvation. He is our access to God. And I think that's what the difference is perhaps between this, this expression, I am the door, compared to the expression, I am the way. Because the, it, being on the way will certainly take you to God, but the door it implies that the, the, there's a guarded access and it's only by entering through that door that you can have access to salvation. Um, and that's depicted for us in his death. Uh, literally, in Matthew 27, verse 51, we read the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It's almost as though access 
to that holy place was suddenly made available. And it's a beautiful image, which again runs through uh, the Bible. It's like a golden thread. And we see it. We're going to go into the Old Testament in a bit and see this, uh, this imagery brought out for us. Um, Hebrews 10. Let, let's turn this one up, if you don't mind. So I'm going to go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, uh, and I'm going to jump in verse 26. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Well, first we're going to go in verse 17, where he says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith, with a heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see that our sins have now been forgiven. And in symbol, we have the curtain of his flesh the door which is now open, that believers can draw near to God. Um, then verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, then no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy in the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? So on the one hand, we, have, we certainly have access now, which wasn't open to the Gentiles or wasn't even open to the Jews before, to this most holy, to this uh, position of, of salvation that was afforded by the sacrifice of Christ. And he says that back in the Old Testament, if you, if you committed a sin, you would have been judged for it. How much more will you be judged if you turn your back on Christ? And he says, it's almost as though you're tramping Christ underfoot. You're stamping on him as you leave. So as you leave that sheepfold, it's almost as though you're stamping on Christ as the door. Um, and we will come back to that, that idea of trampling on the blood. Um, and we're going to see that actually that links into the Old Testament. So just try and keep uh, that imagery in mind. But what we're going to do is we're going to skip to Ephesians because this in, in Hebrews is written to the Jews. Is it also to the Gentiles? Well, we know that it is because I've alluded to it already. And we know our scriptures. Um, Ephesians chapter two. talking about being grafted in um, verse 11 Ephesians 2 verse 11 therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands remember that you were that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world and it continues down and it shows it creates a division for us. But it says that it's almost as though this has been broken down by Christ. Verse 14, for he himself, speaking of Christ, is our peace. And it has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So it's almost as though before we had this barrier, the curtain, which has now been taken down, completely removed. So before there was no access, but now that there is. And we could um, see that if we wanted to in chapter three and chapter four. But I think for time, we'll just keep moving forward. Now, this idea of accessing salvation because of a door it is not new to the sheepfold. It's, it's an image, a golden thread, which runs through the Old Testament, and we also see it in the New Testament as well. So 
what I want us to do now uh, for a few minutes or so is to go through and have a look at four different examples in the Old Testament where we can see illustrated for us nicely this principle of salvation through a door. Because a door was there, there was salvation. And I'm going to suggest in each of these um, seemingly unrelated accounts, we have a picture of Jesus Christ as the door. And I think the fact that we can see it tells us that actually God definitely intended for us to see it and he definitely put it there on purpose. So the, the one we've alluded to already is all to do with the Passover. So come back with me to Exodus chapter 12 and we'll just pick up a few verses to illustrate our point. We see in Exodus 12 a, a real importance around the door, and that, that door alluding to salvation. And we know that during this Passover feast, almost everything which took place, we can link to being a type of Christ, particularly this idea of the door. So Exodus 12, let's just pick out some, ver some verses. Verse 3, I tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to his father's houses, a lamb for a household. Uh, verse 6, 7. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So they have these lambs that they need to keep and they're going to kill them. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. So now we're told that they need to take this blood and they need to paint it on the door frame. OK, so already this idea of a door that we have. So we're thinking, how does this take us to Christ? Verse 12. For it shall pass, for I will pass through the land of Egypt. This is God speaking that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, so this is the blood that they painted on the doorposts. I will pass over you, the Passover. And no plague will befall you to destroy you. When I strike the land of Egypt. And th th this is literally crying out, Lord Jesus Christ. This is a, a beautiful picture, a really strong illustration of Christ for us here. If I said the word beautiful, actually, it wouldn't have been beautiful at all. It would have been graphic. Painting the blood up on the doorpost. It would have been quite a, quite a gothic sight, a hideous sight to behold. And that blood, of course, would have just ran down the side of the doorposts and it wouldn't have been pleasant to consider. But we have then the idea that there would have been blood across the floor. Now, what weren't they to do? We have some more instructions. Verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourselves according to the clans and kill the Passover lamb. Uh, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood of the lintel and of the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. OK, now the extra bit of detail we had there was that they weren't to leave the door they weren't to leave their house because if they were to leave the house they would have been trampling underfoot the blood of christ and that's exactly what we read in hebrews 10 verse 26 hebrews 10 verse 26 was all about if they were to leave then they would be trampling underfoot the blood of christ and the lesson is clear and it's an excitation for us isn't it if we want to be saved, then we need to associate, we need to cling on to the Lord Jesus Christ and make sure we are in his house, we are in his ecclesia. Okay, so moving forward from um, the Exodus, I'd like to come with me to Joshua chapter 2. So the people have just left Egypt and they're on their journeys and we are going to consider Rahab just for a minute so Joshua chapter 2 and we see here again this exact same principle it's almost as though the Passover is being reenacted 
but in a slightly different way. And I think it's done again for us here and it's illustrated in this way. So we can see again this type where Christ is the door. Salvation is found at the door. So Joshua chapter two. Let's go, please. Verse 15. Then she let them down by a rope through the window. So this is speaking of Rahab and the spies. The spies came to uh, find salvation or, or to be saved by Rahab. Uh, Rahab protects them from the city, the men of the city that were trying to kill them. Um, and eventually she lets them out down by a rope through the window for her house was built on the city wall that she lived in the wall. Um, verse, we're going to go to, I've skipped forward a few verses. No, I haven't. We're going to go to verse 19. And she said to them, go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterwards you may go your way. Men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet, this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and you shall gather into your house, your father and your mother and your brother and all your father's household. And if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be upon his own head and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. And we know that from the story, it continues that everybody who was in Rahab's house was saved. She was given the exact same instructions as Moses gave to the people of Israel. He said, stay in the house and you will live. Just like before. Instead, it wasn't blood painted, but it was a scarlet thread hung on the window. And it's almost as though this time, this further instruction is to tell us that we're not only to stay in the house, but we're also to witness. Just as all the Egyptians would have seen the blood painted on the doors, people may have been able to see this cord which she hung from her window. And the instruction that's given to her is really, really clear. Go into your house and gather your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household, everybody, all of her family was to be brought in. And we too have the same responsibility, don't we, to look after our family, whether it be ecclesial, whether it be our natural family, we need to ensure that everyone is there, everyone is kept safe. Okay, our next example, we're going to go back in time. Uh, we're going to go all the way to Genesis. And um, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 7. Because in Genesis chapter 7, we are introduced to Noah's Ark, which he built. And there is a beautiful image here. And once again, we find salvation comes at the door. Genesis 7. Um, let's just pick out some verses. So we're looking at the section verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, and on the day, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of heaven were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, notice his family are there again. And Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, every bird according to its kind, every wind creature. They went into the ark, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And I think this is the most important part of this section. And the Lord shut him in. Okay, so what can we glean from this that's different? Now, this time, it's clear to us that there's only one door. This ark was constructed with just one door, and that's made quite clear. The Lord shut them in. They all went in through that door. And it's not like uh, the Hollywood film where Tubal Cain sneaks into the ark in an attempt to kill Noah. 
there's just one door and there's one way to access salvation and we know the illustration is speaking of Christ but here the illustration is a bit bolder in the sense that it's, it's quite clear for us that at some point the time will come for God's judgment and only after judgment salvation will come and we need to make up our minds. The same excitation that we've seen in the other two passages. We need to decide which side of the door are we going to be on. Because God shut the door. Not man. And we don't decide the parameters of God's grace. Nor do we know when he is coming. But at some point the door will shut. I heard a, a, a point drawn out from this verse recently and I, I can't stop thinking about it. Uh, I think it was a sister actually at my meeting. She said, just imagine if Noah had shut the door. You might think, well, it's, it's not much different. I'm sure you know, God might have put a seal on it. If everything was watertight, it was fine. But just imagine actually that if you were Noah, and you shut the door. And then the water came. And suddenly all those people that were mocking you for maybe some time or perhaps some of your friends, people that you associated with, were a bit different to you spiritually, but actually kind of understood you and you got along with. And they were banging at the door as the water was rising, banging and begging for you to let them in. Just imagine how much stress that would have put on Noah. It would have been too much for any man to bear. But here, God is the judge, isn't he? Man is not the judge. And God is just and swift in his judgment. You know, he, he, he shut the door so that there was no need for Noah to do it himself. Which I thought was a beautiful point when I thought about it. I'd only ever thought about the salvation which was secure for Noah not actually the burden that, and the stress that perhaps such an event would have put on a man. Uh, our last reference in the Old Testament, we, we, I want to take us to one more in the New Testament if we have time. I think we will. Last one I want us to think about in the Old Testament, Genesis 19. Okay, so Genesis 19, we have Sodom and Gomorrah. And again, in this account, we have salvation at the threshold of a door. OK, let's pick out the, the, some verses. So um, we're going to go in at verse four. So Genesis 19, verse four. Um, two angels have, have come at this point to uh, visit Lot and they come into his house. And it says verse four, but before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they came to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance and he shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing for these men, for they have come into the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. And he pressed hard against the man lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. And the wicked people who had no place in God's salvation were made blind to the door entirely. And where have we seen that? Well, we saw it in the context, didn't we? To John chapter 10, where Christ says, I am the door. In John chapter 9, Christ proclaims 
the Pharisees blind. And we've got that same pattern here, all the way back in Sodom and Gomorrah, a pattern which could only have been constructed by a Heavenly Father. Matthew 11, Jesus says to the Pharisees, speaking of the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, if they had seen what you have seen, they would have repented. The Pharisees, it's almost as though they were worse than these men of Sodom. They were made blind and they could not find the door. Christ was the door. And he was right in front of the scribes and the Pharisees and they couldn't see him. And we too, of course, have a responsibility to make sure we are not blind to the grace of God today. Okay. Finally then, uh, our last set of verses. Come with me to Revelation chapter 3. And this, just to illustrate, all the way back in Genesis, now I'm going to go all the way through to the end of the Bible and see the same thread pulling through that Jesus Christ is a door presented to us so perfectly. Um, so Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at the letters to the seven different ecclesias. And this first one that we're going to consider is the one to Philadelphia. It's actually the last two of the letters. So uh, the letter to Philadelphia is verse 7 through to verse 13. Uh, we're just going to do the first couple of verses. Now, Philadelphia primarily was a good ecclesia, and the second one we're going to look at later this year was a, quite a negative ecclesia. Um, they didn't seem to be shining the light very well. So verse 7 says, And to the angel of the ecclesia in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens, and no one will shut, who shuts, and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. This was a strong ecclesia, and they had the word of God. The gospel was flowing, and consequently, it says the door was open. In verse 10, we see that they kept the word with patience. And we need to be patient, don't we? Recognising that God's hand is at work now more than ever. Patience is key when we're stuck in this, in this strange limbo world of 2020. In verse 11, the excitation is, I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. And let us hold fast onto the hope that we have. And we might think, oh, it's quite a negative way to end, Sim, to end with this, um, this Ecclesia and Laodicea, these next few verses. But let's just have a look. So this is the Ecclesia which had really let themselves go and weren't following properly. But verse 14, and to the angel of the Ecclesia and Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. So quite condemnatory words. But what does he say? Verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, what's not happened here is that Christ has not shut the door on, these, on this ecclesia, has he? It seems as though this ecclesia has shut the door themselves. Does that mean Christ has, has washed his hands of this ecclesia? No, not at all. Instead, he's calling them back. Verse 19, calling them to repent and he is knocking at the door. The grace of God knows no bounds, brethren and sisters, whether we are sometimes placing ourselves in the ecclesia in Laodicea or whether we are standing strong in the ecclesia in Philadelphia. And it's our job to ensure that 
to our best of our ability, we are trying to act like the Ecclesia of Philadelphia, that we are patient and trusting in God. We need to make sure that we stay in the house, don't we? That we're a witness to those around wherever we are able, that we might share in the salvation and the safety of the sheepfold like Noah, like Rahab, like the children of Israel, and like Lot and his family, having access to life boldly through the door, even Jesus Christ. Thank you.